Sunday nighters, how are you? I'm still, my mind is in this like worship mode still. So I want to get right to God's word, okay? We're in John chapter 16 and we're going to pick it up at verse 16. Hmm. Okay, so here's what Jesus has to say. Let's get right into it. John chapter 16, verse, verse 16. We're going to finish up this chapter tonight. Jesus says, A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us? A little while you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, and because I go to the Father... They said, therefore, what is that that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. Now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while you will see me? Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. And your joy no one will take from you. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. But I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray uh, pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you've loved me, and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father, and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly, and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered him, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's stop there and pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. Thank you for pouring out your spirit during worship, God. Lord, we've worshiped you in song, and we choose to worship you now in your word. So Holy Spirit, will you fill this place, Lord, with your presence, and help us understand these scriptures. In Jesus' name, we all agreed by saying... Amen. Well, happy Thanksgiving again. If no one's told you Merry Christmas. It was like Christmas at my house like a couple of days ago. I love Christmas. Look, the stage is red now. I love it. I know this doesn't sound like a Christmas message, but there is a gift here, and it's joy. Great joy tonight as we get into John 16. Finish up John 16. So where are we going tonight? Well, this is where we're going. We're going to go down this path and we're going to learn a little bit about healthy curiosity. We're also going to learn about joy and who God likes. You guys ever wanted to know who God likes? We're going to learn that tonight. So This is a fun study. I really enjoyed putting it together. Well, actually, I really enjoyed reading about it. And share. I'm excited to share it with you guys. So let's jump right into the first verse. Verse 16. A little while, 
and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Father. So in a matter of hours, what's going to happen? Well, Jesus is going to the cross. He's going to be arrested at Gethsemane in a little bit. He's also going to be tried, and then he's going to be crucified. Three days afterwards, he'll empty the tomb he was placed in. Now, he's talking to the disciples here. They just finished the Last Supper. He just washed and scrubbed all their their feet. He was sharing things with them. He's saying, okay, guys, we just finished dinner. Let's get up. Let's take a walk. They walk by uh, the the temple in Jerusalem. They see these beautiful vines coming up the columns, and he goes, I, look, guys, I'm the vine. Abide in me. Man, abide in me so you can thrive and bear fruit. So he's having this whole uh, final like, message with these guys. And we're, kind of, we're, we're going through the last of this message. Because in chapter 17, it's this awesome prayer, and we'll get to that next week. But tonight, we're going to learn a little bit about curiosity, about joy, and who God likes. So he says this, in a little while you will not see me, and again in a little while. He's referring to the cross, the resurrection, okay? Let's go to 17 and 18. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us a little while? You will not see me. Again, a little while. You will see me because I go to the Father. What is this that he says? We don't know what he's saying. I'm positive that I'm not the only one that's ever read scripture and said, what? Like, what on earth is he saying? I went to school to study scripture, and many times, I felt like when I was in school, I was like crying and complaining, like, I didn't know what I didn't know. I still don't know. Help me, Lord. They're making it difficult, these seminary professors. Well, let me tell you, it's okay to be curious and ask questions. You can ask questions of the Lord. Questions, question is different than rejection. Ask questions. How else will you get to know somebody unless you ask them how their day is, where they're from? How'd you do that? How else will we learn? When I first started on Sunday nights, I would share, I always uh, ask several questions when I'm approaching a Bible study. Who, what, where, when, why, and how? As, a, as an investigator, that's what I would ask every time I got a case file. Who, what, where, when, why, and how? And, you know, six months later, we'd be at court trying to answer them all. Who, what, where, when, why, and how is how I learn and pull apart these gospel narratives like the one we're reading tonight. So ask some questions. If you're confused, ask for help. Phone a friend. And not just, I mean, you can phone us here at the church. We get those calls all the time. Hey, what does this mean? Or, you know, like on pastor's perspective, people just call in and they they phone all these questions. Even better than any pastor that's ever walked the earth, we have the Holy Spirit. It's his job to build up the church. It's okay to ask questions. Take the pressure off yourself. God does not expect you to know it all. He doesn't expect Pastor Rick or Pastor Ed, even though it seems like he knows it all. God doesn't expect Pastor Ed to know it all. He wants us to to learn and have room to mature in him. It's how we learn. So, church, stay curious. Stay curious, church. Now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. He said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves what I said? Guys, I can see it on your face. Are you guys wondering what it is that I'm talking about? He didn't mind that they were inquiring. He didn't mind that they were among themselves talking and having a small study group while they were walking. Like, did you hear what he said? Peter, did you catch what he said about you? Like, (laughs) they were talking amongst themselves and trying to learn. Kind of like a little first century Bible study group. It's okay to ask things of the Lord. He wants us to be curious, and he says it's okay. What does this say about Jesus? He's not oblivious. He could see it on their faces. He knows that they're talking about him. He's not oblivious. He's observant. Jesus knows what's on our hearts and our minds. 
Check this out in Psalm 139. This is how 139 begins, Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. He knows us so well. Check this out. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold. David's saying, check it out, Lord. Check it out, reader. O Lord, you know it all together. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4. He knows us. He's observant. Jesus knew what was on their minds, just as he knows what's on our hearts and minds. He knew about their desire to learn. So again, what does this tell us about the Lord? He knows our hearts and minds too, not just the disciples he was talking with and walking with. So if you have something on your heart, how can we go to the Lord? Uh, Through prayer. Pray, talk with him. He knows our desires to learn about him. And as as we saw in last week's message, Jesus will reveal information to us at the right moment as we need it. He helps us. He gives us grace, mercy in the time of need. So Jesus knows what they're asking for, and here's what he shares in verse 20. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and and lament, but the world will rejoice and and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. With this verse, we're, we're told we need to fix firmly in our minds. You're going to be in deep mourning, is what he tells the disciples. Man, what you guys are going to see when I'm whipped and beaten, as they're punching me and messing, on, messing with me and spitting on me, you're going to be in deep sorrow, okay? Deep mourning while the godless world throws a party. That's what they did, these, the Romans and the Jewish leaderships. They were all excited to see Jesus crushed the way he was. You'll be sad, very sad, but your sadness will be turned into gladness. What? What does he mean by that? I'm going to watch my friend and teacher get murdered on the cross. But my sadness, my deep, sorrowful mourning, as Jesus described, is going to be turned into gladness. Jesus is talking here about his arrest and his crucifixion and resurrection to his students. The world, as I said, was the Romans, the Jewish leadership. They're the ones who are kind of throwing this party and rejoicing. Why is Jesus doing, they just had a great supper. I mean, they were a little weird hearing about Peter and Judas and whatnot, and they're still working out like, where is he going? And now they're like saying he's, you're going to be, I'm going to be sad, Jesus? Why is he saying all this? Well, he tells them all of this stuff because he wants them to have hope. He wants them to have confidence. He wants them to be assured which they want, he wants them to have security in the words that he's saying, like, guys, know this. You're going to be all messed up for a little bit and sad, but it's going to be turned into gladness. Okay, I'm coming back. I'm only gone for a little while, but I'm coming back. Then he likens their reaction to a woman going through labor and delivery, a thing that causes great pain and will be the thing that causes great rejoicing. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. It's scary and difficult for a mom to give birth to a child. However, there's so much joy when the baby was born. I was there and present when both my girls were born. And as I studied this verse, and I was going through it, and I thought, how am I going to share this? All I kept thinking is, when I was there watching them, you know, be born, I, I recalled vividly the, the situations. 
And what I'm, what I'm left with when I was thinking that is like, my wife is so brave. I remember thinking as my tears are flooding my eyes, like, man, my wife, she seems like she's got it all together. She was so brave when giving birth to our girls. She may have been frightened, but she was so brave. In the moment, like, she, was, she got to hold him, joy, joy, joy flooded the room. Tears and smiles and love seemed to be endless. And then they both learned how to talk. Diaper changes. Ah. Oh. I know, yikes. My brother-in-law is going through it with his little boys right now. And he's like, I can't wait till they're older like the girls. I'm all, dude, enjoy that while it lasts. And me and my wife are like, we don't, we don't miss the diapers in the late nights. Verse 22. Therefore, you now have sorrow. But I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. Well, your heart will sorrow. But that joy, no one's going to take it from you. The sadness you have right now is similar to that of birth pain, but the coming joy is also uh, similar. When I see you again after the resurrection, he's telling them, you'll be full of joy. It'll be that type of joy that no one can rob you of. You see, the world wants us to not focus on a three-letter word like joy. The world wants us to go after happiness, happiness that comes and goes with circumstances as they ebb and flow. That's what it, the world is going to want us to, to chase after. So when our circumstances change, what else changes? Our mood. We get all bummed out. Well, let me tell you, happiness, that's not based on circumstances. Joy is not based just on circumstances. God wants to remind us to place our hope and joy not on circumstances that will always be variable. It will always be going up and down and all around as long as we're alive. He wants us instead to place our hope and our joy on Jesus Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Place our hope and joy on Jesus Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one who doesn't change, by the way. Our Lord doesn't change. Jesus Christ, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I have a verse for that, Hebrews 13, 8. Joy no one will take from you. Let's talk about this for a minute. It seems that this joy is a hallmark It's a mark of authenticity of a believer. Joy that no one can take, take, snatch from you by force, fear, trickery, okay? No one can take this joy. So let's talk joy, this biblical definition of joy. Kara is the Greek word that we get our English word joy from, okay? Kara. A state of delight and well-being that results from knowing and serving God. Let me read that again. State of delight and well-being that results from knowing and serving God. Joy is the fruit of a right relation with God. It's not something you can just create by your own efforts. I can't just create it by my own efforts. The Bible distinguishes, shows differences between joy and pleasure, right? The Greek word for pleasure is the word we get our word hedonism. It's a philosophy of self-centered pleasure seeking. This is how Paul, he refers to these false teachers as lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 2 Timothy 3, 4. God has joy. God has joy. And Luke 15 is probably the most famous biblical reference to God's joy. The Pharisees and scribes had criticized Jesus for receiving sinners and eating with them. Then Jesus told three parables, right? The parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. These explicit 
themes, the explicit theme of each of these parables is joy over one sinner who repents and changes his mind, his or her mind about the Lord. God's joy, his kids coming back and thinking correctly about him. <clears throat> Jesus spoke of his own joy and the full joy he had that he had come as he brought others closer to him. He illustrated the kingdom of heaven, telling the joy of the man who found the treasure. He told us about the man who found the treasure. He told us about Zacchaeus, how he was in a tree when Jesus called him, but he quickly climbed down and received Jesus joyfully. He had found life's ultimate treasure in Christ. Joy, joy in the Christian life is in direct proportion as believers walk with the Lord. What does that mean? Okay, they can rejoice because they are in the Lord. The more they're in the Lord, the more joy. Joy is a result of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. Joy is the result of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. Joy is the evidence of the presence of God in our lives. Joy is the evidence of the presence of God in our lives. Now, we can eliminate joy. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just said that no one can rob you of this. I can eliminate it. Yeah, I could keep sinning. No joy on their sin. It gets in the way. Because sin is what gets in the way of my relationship with the Lord. Start sinning. Sin in a believer's life. And it robs a person of joy. But when a person walks with the Lord, the, per the person can continue to rejoice even when troubles come. And they will come. This is the joy that will come in the morning. Joy can be had though troubles ensue. Joy can be had uh, though, although troubles do go on. We have joy as we hope in Jesus. This present trouble that you might be facing, the present trouble, it's for a, it's, but for a moment. Well, it doesn't seem like a moment, Rick. It seems like it's been going on for a really long time. You have no idea what I'm going through. I don't. And I know what I'm saying is a lot easier to say than it is to like endure tough and challenging circumstances. I get that. But in light of eternity, a thousand years from now, believer, brethren, when we're worshiping, you thought that worship set was amazing? Wait till we get to heaven. Like, you thought Matthew Ward was awesome? Wait till we get to heaven. I mean, we're going to be with the Lord. No more tears, no more fears, no more sickness, no more disease, no more stinking COVID, famine, or anything. The Lord and every believer since the beginning of time, worshiping, singing song, everybody's going to be like, oh, you know, like loving on the Lord, joy. And we're going to be like, wait, what happened in 2020? A thousand years from now. Hmm. Lord, may your kingdom come quickly, as quickly as possible, Lord. That's <sighs> what happens when I stop talking from my notes. I get all lost. Okay, so joy, joy, okay. Uh, verse 23, and in that day you will ask me nothing, he says. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask in my Father's name, he will give you. Okay, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about prayer. Simple conversation with the Lord. Prayer. He's saying we've got direct access to God the Father through Jesus in prayer. Direct access to God the Father through Jesus in prayer. Until now, you've asked nothing, nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I like the message translation of this verse. If, if we teach out of the New King James, a little Bible study tip, we teach out of the New King James here at the Packing House, but if, if you're sitting down and you have your Bible app open, Uversion's Bible app's free, anyone can download it, they have tons of Bible translations on there. Sometimes when you're going through a translation and then you get like the NIV or the message or NLT or 
I don't know. It's like having a bunch of like scholars translating verses for you. But as you know, like if you come here to the packing house, we teach through the New King James. As I was studying up on these verses, I was reading the message translation and check out how it says, until now you have asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive it that your joy may be full. Here's what the message says. This is what I want you to do. I'm quoting the message. Yeah, Eugene Peterson's the message translation. This is what I want you to do. Ask the Father for whatever is in keeping with the things I've revealed to you. Ask the Father for whatever, right? He says, ah, this is what I want you to do. Ask the Father for whatever is in keeping with the things I've revealed to you. Ask in my name, according to my will, and he'll most certainly give it to you. Your joy will be a river overflowing its banks. Have you guys ever seen a river overflowing its banks? Uh, years ago, I was a paid call firefighter in Forest Falls. We owned a cabin up there, and they asked if I would help volunteer at the fire department. One Labor Day, we were all, all the firemen and their families got together, and we were having a barbecue, and all their pagers start going off. If you're under 50, a pager is something that would beep and a message would come through. And it'd go, beep, beep, beep. <laughs> well, this pager was cool because it told us where we needed to go. So we all load up. We get over to, to the creek up there in Forest Falls. It wasn't a little creek. This thing was rushing. It was overflowing at its banks. Giant boulders were thundering down. I was sitting there going, I have never seen anything like this in my life. And then logs were just flowing down, and then there was people on the other side going, we can't cross. And I'm like, I'm going back to the barbecue. No, they got back over. So what is, why, did, why bring this up? Your joy will be a river overflowing its banks. It's a joy that no one can rob from you that will take you through the troublesome boulders and logs that are storming up the life, that are flowing by you, getting ready to take you out. But joy that Jesus gives, a relationship that Jesus gives as you walk with him and talk with him, fellowship with the church, his body, this joy takes you through the this craziest of circumstances, okay? When, the, when the, the river is raging by, joy will overflow, okay, in our lives, believer. You've asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive... He, God's not a genie, okay? That's not what he means. God wants to give us a new heart, Ezekiel 36, 26 says. He wants to give us a new heart, gives us a new spirit. And when he does that, back in Ezekiel, God says, when he gives us that new heart, that new spirit, he causes us to walk in his judgments and do them, okay? Pastor Ed always shares it like this. God gives us this new heart, new spirit, and he changes our want-tos will start doing the things he wants us to do. Believer, as you mature in Christ, you'll start praying the way God wants us to start praying. So I was telling the worship leaders in the back as we were talking about worship and God's word, it's like, it's a big recycle program. God pours down all his stuff and recycles it back up to him in praise. We were talking about worship leaders before they came out. And it's like this big recycle program. We get God's want-tos in our hearts and we begin to want the same things that he wants for our lives and the lives around us. Ah, let's go on to verse 25. These things I have spoken to you in a figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in a figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. He's talking about the symbolic language, the figurative language, all the parables that he used as Jesus talked. Most of the time when Jesus is giving instruction, if you haven't noticed, believer, through these gospel narratives, he's teaching through stories, okay? As he walks by the temple, sees the grapevine, and goes, guys, I'm the grapevine. Y'all stay attached to me, branches, and you'll do what? Bear fruit. That's how Jesus taught. More often than he didn't teach that way, he always used things that the people in front of him understood. And then he laid aside, cast aside, alongside a biblical truth. That's what a parable is. Right? It's a story relevant to the listener. 
and there's a, a, a truth cast alongside it. That's what parable means. But he always did it in such a way that drew the believer and the listener in. So if someone wanted to learn a little more, they would be asking what? Questions. Oh, I need to learn more about that. And those people that were like, I don't have time for that, Jesus was like, peace. <laughs> peace I give to you and you just rejected. <laughs> he tries to draw them in. Again, none of this is on my notes. I either need to say I'm going to stick to my notes or I'm not so we can get through this study. Sorry, everyone. Uh, okay, verse 26. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. Lord, I just thought you said you were going to not talk in confusing language. Remember, here's what he's saying. Remember, do you remember John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have direct access to God the Father through God the Son via our faith, confidence, belief in the Son. Okay? We have direct access to God the Father through God the Son via our faith, our confidence, our trust, our belief in Him, and His grace. No human high priest needed. Oh, man. He's saying, like, uh, you're not going to need me to pray for you like that. You can pray and talk with God directly. Okay, he's not just talking to the 21st century believer who's read John 14, 6. Okay, in their lifetimes, John hasn't written any of the stuff we're reading right now. So we've got to study within context, understand the background of this message. John's living it right now. So, they've always had a high priest, do you, okay, we're going into Christmas time. Every good Christmas story doesn't just start with the angels visiting Gabriel and, I mean, uh, Gabriel visiting uh, Mary and then the vision to Joseph. No, no, it starts a little six months before that as Zechariah, a priest, is going in to offer, do offerings and prayers and they needed him to go forth. Yeah, we don't need that anymore. No high priest. But to the first century Jew, this was like mind-blowing. If they would have had the little mind-blowing emoticon back then, this would have been right there. They would have been like, what? You mean we don't need Caiaphas to go in and offer prayers for us? I mean, what, we don't need those guys? No. You have direct access to God the Father. Ask. Ask, and it'll be given to you. This would have blown their minds. You can make those desires that God's giving you, you can ask about them, you can talk with him directly. And just wait, 50 days after I come back to life, when the Holy Spirit comes, that's another, like, phew, the church is blown up by the, by the Holy Spirit as he comes, and he's, like, pouring out gifts and adding people. It's amazing, this direct access, this relationship that a believer has with the Lord. It's amazing. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. And have believed that I came, I came forth from God. For the Father loves you. So often we've been reading about the word love as we've gone through the book of John. And if you'll remember, there's love. There's four different Greek words for love. There's agape. Okay, the agape, which is like the love the undeserving love that we have from God, the love that we're told to do, not just feel, we don't feel this for others, we just do it, it's actionable, this love. Then there's phileo, that's brotherly love. Phileo sounds a lot like the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. There's storgi, family love, hopefully you guys in, in, enjoyed that this week. Family love, storgi. And then eros, that intimate love between man and woman, so eros. He's not talking agape, storge, or eros here, okay? He's, we've already talked about curiosity. It's okay to be curious. We've talked about joy. We're going to talk about who God likes, who he's fond of. It's not agape love. It's not storge or eros. It's phileo. God likes you, right? God likes you, really? Uh, sometimes I don't like myself. Oh, God likes you. It's right here. You got a verse for that? Yeah, right here, verse 27. The Father himself likes you because you like me. We all like each other in here. 
great. And you have believed that I came forth from God. I like you. I like you. I don't like myself sometimes. Yeah, me neither. I, I don't like myself. It's not that I don't like you guys. I like you guys. <sighs> Growing up, I'd irritate certain people that were close to me, and they would say, you know, I've got to love you. I don't got to like you right now. Go to the other room. Yeah, that would happen to me. And so I clearly understood what this meant here, the like. Yeah, I know sometimes we are going through seasons of our life where we're like, I can't believe I did that, and I don't like myself. And we start judging ourselves super harshly. But you're not qualified to judge yourself. I'm qualified to judge you, so come here after service and I'll tell you. No, I'm not either. I'm not either. I'm checking to see if everyone's here and awake with me. I'll judge you. Just line up right here. Oh my gosh, that'd be terrible. Hopefully I come back next week. Um, I'm not qualified to judge you, and you're not qualified to judge you, okay? I'm not qualified to judge myself. None of us are qualified. How do I know? It's written in the Bible. Here, check this out. 1 Samuel 16, 7. They're looking for a new king, the, hot, the priest back then. He's looking for Samuel. He's looking for a priest. And he's looking at all these strapping young dudes looking for a king. And the Lord said, but the Lord, in 1 Samuel 16, chapter 7, he says to the Lord, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature. Stop looking at that stud over there, Samuel, because I've rejected him. For the Lord, here's where we're not qualified. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Dang. The Lord doesn't look at what we're looking at. He's not looking at if we're buff or we have that like killer runner's bod or whatever. No, he's looking at our heart. Okay? We're not qualified to inspect other guys' hearts. Okay? We're not, but the Lord is. You may go through those times of sadness and I'm upset. I don't really like myself right now. But now you have a verse where God says, I like you. I love you to death, as Greg says. He loves us to death. Look at the cross. He likes you too. That's cool. Verse 28, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world again. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Jesus came from the Father and into this world. Why? For you and I, because he likes us. He's going to die on the cross for our sins, removing that barrier between us and the Lord. He's dying for our sins in just a few hours, removing our barrier be between us and the Lord. We can go directly to God through Jesus. Not of our works. We can't throw ourselves on a cross and make it happen by what Jesus did. It's for, by grace, God's free gift that we've been given. By grace, we've been saved through faith. Man, it's, it's a gift. It's not works. No one could brag about it. I paraphrased Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. How? 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 Well, through prayer, believer, God wants to hear from you. How can I go directly to God? Through prayer. God likes you enough to listen to you. Everything you've got. He wants it. Tell him. I've been angry at the Lord because this is happening in my family. Talk to the Lord about it. I don't know. Is it okay to be angry? Talk to God. Talk to God. He can handle it. He wants you to talk with him because he's a loving listener who cares deeply about you. He wants your joy to be full and knows that will only take place if we stay connected to Jesus. We all, it'll only happen if we stay connected to Jesus. His disciples said to him, Okay, see, now you're speaking plainly and not using any figure of speech. We get it. I don't know, but they said they get it. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need for anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered him, do you now believe? Like, really, now you get it after three years and all this talk? Now you get it? Yeah, we'll see. Because indeed the hour, he says, is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered like cockroaches. No, he says, to each to his own house and will leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone. That's what happens when he was getting arrested. All his friends ran. When I shared that same verse in juvenile hall, 
I go, where are all your friends that were with you when you're committing this crime? And they're like, uh, what friends? Well, that's right. What friends? They all scattered like cockroaches, and you're here with Pastor Rick on Thursday night. These guys scattered. And they left me alone, but I am not alone, Jesus says. You are not alone. If you feel like people have kind of scattered, you're not alone, because God the Father, remember, he likes you. He's with you. He loves you. He cares deeply for you. He's listening to you as you're talking to him. You're not alone. These things I've spoken to you, that in me, you may have peace. In me, not away from me, not just talk to me on Sunday, see you next Sunday if you show up. No, no, no. In me, abide in him and thrive in him. Abide, stay connected. In me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. Everything I said at dinner, and when we left, and now on our walk, in me. I've told you all this so that you know that if you trust me, you'll be unshakable, assured, secured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, in this godless world, you'll continue to experience difficulties. But take heart, be of good cheer, be encouraged. I've conquered the world. I want your confidence in me so you can have peace. Remember we talked about what to do with a gift? Christmas is coming, so you have three options for gifts, if you'll remember. The three options were take it, set it aside, don't ever open it. Take it, pray there's a gift receipt with it. Take it, open it up, and apply it and use it. I I got a gift of peace, he says, for you guys. This is what the world has. Tribulation. Oh, let me think about it, Lord. You, peace, or the world, tribulation. I want to have Jesus, and the world's going to throw tribulation at me, but I have Jesus. I'm not alone. He cares for me deeply. He likes me. He loves me to death. He lives for me. He's with me all the time. I think we, we know where we should line up with. <clears throat> it's our choice. It's our choice, though, to receive this gift. It's our choice to stay connected to this this vine that Jesus says. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me, in him, bears much fruit, thrives. For without me, you can do nothing. So it's our choice. Do we choose to stay connected to him? How? Through prayer, through study of God's word, through worship, through fellowship. Do we choose to stay connected to him? choose the world? Do we choose confidence, courage from him, or do we choose the world? I'm going to close with a little illustration I read about. Check this out. A little boy was flying on a plane. That plane one day was experiencing violent turbulence. The plane was going up, down, and it was going all around all over the place. The lady sitting next to the little boy, she was terrified. She was freaking out. She couldn't understand why this little boy was just happily playing and having a good time. So after a while of watching him, she couldn't stand it any longer. She snaps at him. Hey, little boy, stop it. Stop having so much fun. How can you have such a good time when all this is happening? The little boy puts his hand on her hand and says, "Uh, Lady, my daddy's the pilot. And when your daddy's the pilot, you can handle the turbulence because you know he's in control. God is in control of the turbulence in our life. That's the confidence that every believer can have. And as we have that confidence, that's, that's, the result is joy through the most painful of circumstances in our life. Now maybe you've been sitting here and you're like, oh, I need to get back to the Lord because I need more joy in my life. Maybe you're thinking, 
I kind of understood what you're saying, and something's been like tugging on my heart that I need to make a commitment. That's the Holy Spirit saying, come on, I've got joy for you. The world's got more tribulation, but I've got, the, I got peace for you. And if that's you, man, we're going to pray with you right now. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we have this safe place to come to you and be curious about you, to get to know you more. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for explaining things that, like, it's okay to be curious about you. What joy is, that joy is different than just happiness that's based on circumstances, because our joy is based on you, Jesus, who doesn't change, who's all-powerful, who loves us and likes us. If you've been sitting here and you're thinking, ah, I want this joy you've been talking about. It starts with the relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a, and we can help you with that. It's a prayer that we pray here often at the church. And we'll pray it out loud with you. You could pray it out loud or you can say it to, to the Lord in your own thoughts and in your own intimacy, in your own heart. But it's a prayer that goes like this and we'll say it with you. Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give myself up to you. Forgive me of your sin, of my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I may have this joy and serve you from this day forward. And all of God's kids agreed by saying, Amen. Church. Hey, if no one's told you that they love you, I love you, church. More importantly, God loves you and he likes you. Good night. God bless you.